Hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Juliana Mustiga and today I'll be showing you how to perform a principal component analysis in R. Let's dive in. Today you will learn what is a principal component analysis or PCA. Why do we use a PCA? We'll also prepare our data to do the analysis and we'll use the print comp function in R. We'll interpret the PCA results and we'll also visualize the results in different ways along with looking at a biplot at the end. So what is a principal component analysis? Imagine you're looking at a cloud of points on the plot representing data like measurements from an experiment. Now one might think that drawing a line through the middle of this cloud in the direction where the data varies the most is just like drawing the best fit line in a regression. However, there's a difference. While a regression line is concerned with predicting one variable from another, our red line labeled PC1, which stands for principal component one, only captures where our data shows the most variation. It's not about prediction, but about summarizing the main spread. Sometimes these two lines, PC1 and the best fit line in the regression, might be very close, but it's good to not assume that they're the same thing. Well, once we've identified the primary direction with PC1, we then look for the next direction where the data varies the most, ignoring the variation already captured by PC1. So this blue line would be our PC2, or principal component 2, and it's always perpendicular or at a right angle to PC1. So an analogy would be PC1 is like the main highway of our data variation, and PC2 is a secondary road. The lengths of these lines show how much variation they capture. Now, you might wonder how many of these lines or components we can have. In a two-dimensional space like our plot, we have two components, PC1 and PC2. But in general, if we have, say, 10 different measurements of variables, we can have up to 10 components. However, in practice, the first few components often capture the bulk of the variation, so we might not need to consider them all. So why would we want to use a PCA? One, we can simplify large, complicated data sets into a way that is easier to understand by highlighting the main trends. We can also focus on major patterns and ignoring unimportant details or noise. It can help us prepare analysis and modeling uh, by organizing our data to make further work more straightforward. And it can help us manage correlated data. Remember, PCA works great because we're assuming that some of the variables are correlated. So that's how you're able to do the dimensionality reduction. So it combines them so that we can have a clearer view as to what's going on. So for today's tutorial, we're going to be using the ggplot2 library for making some plots. And the data set is going to be the iris data set, which comes already with R. Um, if you're not familiar with the iris data set, it's just a data set that has three different species of iris flowers and some measurements of those flowers. So if we look at the data set using view, you'll see sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And then we here have here a column with the, with the respective uh, species of flowers. And there's 150 rows. Before doing a PCA, you want to make sure that you don't have any missing values. So if you look at this data set, you can see that there's nothing missing. There's no NAs or anything, any blanks. But it still is good practice if you do have a data set that you want to try this code with to do this command. So you feed in the name of the data set and complete cases will look at all the rows that are complete and keep only those in terms of not having missing values. And then we'll just save that into another object. I'm calling it iris clean. Now we're going to run our PCA using the spring comp function that comes already with base R. And we're going to feed in our clean data set that remember we removed any rows that were incomplete or that had missing values. In this case, you know, we didn't have, but we, we already did that for good practice. And we're passing in only the first four columns of this data set. So if we look at iris clean, right? The first four are only the values, right? We don't need the labels right now. We just need to pass in the values for the PCA. And it's also good practice to say that we want to use the correlation matrix instead of the covariance matrix. So if we want to use the correlation matrix, you use core equals true. 
And that's because sometimes with different you know, data sets, some of your variables may be in completely different scales and that can affect the PCA results. So to standardize everything, we use the correlation. In this case, as you can see, you know, they're not far off at all. They are, they, you could just use the default, you know, the covariance, but it's just a good practice to use core equals true. And now when we run this, we're going to save it into a PCA result object, and then we're going to do summary PCA result to look at the components. So we have four components. Uh, the proportion of variance for the first one is always going to be the highest. They're always going to be ranked from highest to lowest. So the first principal component, which is a linear combination of these uh, variables or features, ranked uh, using the most, that capture the most variance, accounts for 73% of the variance. That's a lot. So you're able to capture almost yeah, so much of it, it just in the first two components, because look, the component two captures 23% of the variance. And, and this is showing you the cumulative proportion. So yeah, the first one is going to be 73%, and then the 95 or 96% here is basically the 73 plus the 22, 23%. So uh, as you go on, you're always going to capture all the variance. So the last components, when you're doing this looking at the cumulative proportion is always going to sum up to 100%. Uh, but in this case, we can get only use only the first uh, two components because you can capture 96% with the first two components. From the summary PCA, we also have the standard deviation for each component. Uh, if you were to square them, you will obtain the variance for each component. Just remember this because now when we go to look at the scree plot, it's going to show us the variances. So if we look at the scree plot, it's basically going to show you what we already know uh, because we were looking at total proportion of total variance before and we know that component one is the highest, component two is the lowest, etc. etc. But these are on the y-axis, there are the variances which is basically the, the square standard deviations uh, that we saw in the uh, table earlier. And the whole point of the scree plot is kind of to quickly judge which are the most significant components. And by, you do this by looking at where there is an elbow. So if we look at this sharp from component one to component two, we see like a sharp decrease, like a very fast decrease, and then it kind of just starts slowly flattening out. So this would suggest that the elbow is right here at component two, which means that component two and component one, everything before the elbow is significant and everything after is just less, right? So it's just kind of telling us the same thing we saw when we look at the proportion of variance that between these two, I think we capture like 96% of the variance. And after that, you're not really capturing so much anymore. And then if we want to look at how each feature contributes to the principal, principal components, we can look at the loadings. And let's just focus on this table up here. We have the four components, uh, principal components, and then we have the features and the these are the basically these numbers here are the correlations between the components and the original variables, right? So component one is correlated with sepal length by 0.5, uh, slightly negatively correlated uh, with sepal width by negative 0.3, etc. So it looks like it's uh, taking in all the correlations from from these, but this one is in the negative direction. And then component two is mainly uh, just looking at the variation or the correlation uh, with sepal width, right? And so on. Component three is looking at mainly, if you look at just the absolute value of these correlations, the strongest one would be a positive correlation with sepal length. So a sepal length uh, increases, component three increases, right? With this, with this magnitude, et cetera. I won't go into this part here too much because we use the correlation uh, matrix, so everything's going to be standardized to uh, unit variance, uh, so it's not that meaningful or helpful. But uh, if you want to look at cumulative variances, you should look at the one that we gathered from our earlier 
um, table, which was this PCA result. Th this is the one that is informative that tells you how each component uh, contributes to the total variance in, in your data. If we just do plot and feed it our PCA result object, we can generate the similar plot as we have with the scree plot. So it's just the variances for each of the components. Now we can take a look at the scores for each of the components. So if we look at the F scores, we have all the transformations for each of the observations in the data set that is now transformed into the different components. So we're going to grab the first two components, which make up a large proportion of the variance and plot them into a biplot. So to do that, we will extract all the first two components uh, by using this PCA result loadings and then grabbing the first two and saving it into this object. And then I have this code. Uh, you can get it from GitHub to make the plot in ggplot. Uh, but essentially, I'm feeding it the scores. And then I'm just looking at calling component one and component two. Um, and then just kind of coloring uh, by the name of the species. So we can take a look at that and then make sure to print it. So in this biplot, we're plotting the first two components of the 150 points from our data set that were transformed. And here we have principal component one in the X axis, principal component two in the Y axis. You can see that along this uh, PC2 axis, we have the Setosa species. So that means that there's something about PC2 that is helping us distinguish Setosa from the rest of the species. And based on what we can see here in these arrows, is sepal width is kind of pointing towards PC2 along the direction of PC2, right? And it has a long line, which means that it's a high magnitude. So we can say that sepal width is what's di differentiating the Setosa species from the rest, right? I remember in earlier I showed you the PC loadings and I said that for principal component two, we had like a 0.9 value and uh, related uh, between sepal width and PC2. So that's what you're seeing here. For the rest of the species, uh, they're mainly kind of going along PC1. And we for that one, I don't know if you remember, but we also had some high correlations between PC1 and sepal length, pedal width, and pedal length. They were like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and there was one that was a negative correlation. I don't see, maybe it's just the plotting here. But these species are more highly explained by PC1 versus it looks like the second component, PC2, is distinguishing or differentiating uh, Setosa from the two other species. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this content and let me know what else you'd like to see in the comments below.